Okay, well, let's go. All set? Yep. Okay. It is 5.06 p.m. We do have a quorum call this meeting to order. So let's please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, tonight is the first of three budget workshops where uh, we're going to go through the budget in some detail. We've had uh, the Port of Ed Finance Committee has gone through the uh, budget essentially line by line with the help of Mr. Mancini and Mr. Giard. Uh, and so we've gone into that type of detail. Tonight's more, more high level as far as that goes. We'll go section by section after uh, Mr. Giard makes his presentation. Uh, to take questions, address any concerns. There's no action that will be taken tonight on this. This is just an informational sort of thing. These are just workshops. Uh, the actual action will be taken on the uh, meeting on the 28th. So uh, the way this process works, just for anyone who's interested or watching, um, Mr. GR is going to present what, what is referred to as the superintendent's recommended budget. This is the budget that he puts forward that uh, tells us what he thinks he's going to need to keep the, the district moving forward in, in a positive way. Um, once it's approved by the Board of Ed on the 28th, it becomes the Board of Ed budget. From that point forward, it gets on, goes onward to uh, the Board of Finance for review and their, their approval there, and then on to the RTM for the same. And at that point, it would be you know, official, so to speak. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Giard. He'll, he'll uh, uh, provide a sort of presentation on the budget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Bear with me here while I switch over to screen share. Hopefully everybody can see that uh, presentation. Good evening, Board of Ed members, elected officials, administrators, teachers, district staff, and community members. I welcome all of you here tonight to our first budget workshop. I would like to thank our excellent team of professionals for their hard work in the development of this budget. From staff at the schools to our administrators, department supervisors and directors, central office staff, all put in many hours of hard work and thought into the development of this budget. I would like to specifically acknowledge Craig Powers, Joe Mancini, Kathy Ballone, Pam Tineski, Karen Kopeck, Amelia Santangelo and Caroline Whitaker for their countless hours of assistance and hard work over the last several months in the development of this budget. This has been a, both a unique and challenging year in so many ways. The last 10 months in education have been unmatched in their intensity and duration and have caused educators and educational leaders to rethink many aspects of what we do and reimagine the possibilities. Waterford Public Schools has done that well. We have been a district that the Connecticut State Department of Education has looked to as a leader and a model during this turbulent time. Our distance learning model last spring and our reopening plans and hybrid learning guidelines this fall were recognized and shared across the state. The Connecticut State Department of Education asked us to present several times on statewide virtual workshops. Opening schools this past fall required us to reconnect, reinforce, and rediscover our school district in new ways. I remain so proud of the work of this team. As we head towards next year, I believe that the proposed budget continues both our commitment to maintain a high quality education for our students and our responsibility of careful consideration of fiscal resources. The economics of our nation, our state, our town and families remain a concern for all of us. While this budget is modest in its request, it continues to encourage teaching of the highest quality and provides for the necessary professional development to support our staff. This budget will allow us to address the burgeoning needs of our students created by this COVID-19 crisis, both academically and socially and emotionally. 
but at the same time will keep us moving forward and building on the success of recent years. My goal tonight on behalf of our team is to not only show the budget numbers, but also share with you how our budget is operationalized to support student success. We are a mission driven school district. The decisions we make, the programs we implement, the dollars we spend are directly tied to this student centered mission statement. Waterford is a community that values education and views education as a collaborative effort. We know it is imperative to ensure our students leave, leave us prepared for life, learning and work beyond school. Part of sustaining that mission is a coherent budget that enables us to progress towards that goal and meet our students' needs. Each year, this Board of Education sets strong goals in alignment with our district's mission and strategic plan. These goals serve as a roadmap for administration and staff. These goals serve as another set of guidelines in building our budget. The goals this year do take on a different meaning as we navigate a difficult educational landscape during a global pandemic. The board's priorities for the school district continue to be responsive to the world around us as a thoughtful and deliberate goal around equity was added this year. The events of last spring in our country continue to resonate and reverberate in the lives of our students, families, and staff. Preparing our students to quote, be responsible citizens prepared to contribute and succeed in an ever-changing world is core to our mission statement of the Waterford Public Schools. We believe in the power of community and creating a safe and equitable environment for our children and each other. The Waterford Public Schools are committed to an equitable and socially just school district for our students, staff, and community. We know a committed focus on equity for all students is core to our mission. While our district has had various efforts throughout the years, we are formalizing our equity plans to be more focused, cohesive, and deliberate. This slide represents some of the many efforts this school year. We continue to use our district strategic plan as a roadmap towards greater success. We have clearly aligned our goals and work in the district from board goals to classroom practice. A district data team is in place to ensure alignment with our belief as a district that sound decision making is predicated on evidence and information. The FY22 budget continues the goals and objectives of the strategic plan. The actions we take as a board of education and as a school district should actively contribute to what we do next. What we've already built will absolutely help us with what comes next. Our budget is one very observable way that tangible support is needed and vital. School districts require resources of time, energy, and money to continue to grow. I'd like to share a few highlights from recent years as examples of how investments in our school district translate into student outcomes. One of the most visible ways a school district can measure their performance is performance on the SBAC assessment. While I shared this information last year as we did not take summative state assessments last spring, I also know we have many new families and many new elected officials watching tonight. SBAC is the state mandated statewide assessment administered in grades three through eight to every student. Waterford has seen tremendous results on SBAC due to the hard work of our teachers, leaders, and most of all, our students. Our continued focus on math is evident and our strong performance in late language arts continues to climb. The last administration of SBAC saw the district's highest scores ever. These scores represent students, student outcomes. We have more students achieving at goal and above than ever before. We have more students than ever before earning college credit while in high school. 937 college credit courses were taken at Waterford High School in the form of dual experience, community college credits, UConn ECE, and AP courses, saving Waterford families 
potentially over $1.7 million in college tuition this year. Of all the K-12 school districts across the state, Waterford is inside the top third of the highest performing K-12 school districts in the state of Connecticut. While, while our students' needs have increased exponentially in the last decade, our student achievement and district performance continues to climb. Waterford, a Derg D district, continues to outperform many districts in Dergs A, B, and C. We have much to be proud of and to celebrate. Successful student outcomes do not come without having a plan. Our investment in a rigorous academic program, our continued commitment to social and emotional learning, our promise to educate the whole child through the arts, co-curricular and athletic programs, and an unwavering pledge to continually develop our staff all contribute to the success of our district. In virtue of a consistent curriculum renewal cycle, we recognize that education changes rapidly and the skills and concepts required of students are higher than ever. Challenging our students, keeping them engaged and promoting an environment of inquiry are so important. We know that if students' social, emotional, and mental health needs aren't met, their chances of succeeding academically are greatly diminished. We have a robust team of mental health professionals in our district, but the job of meeting these needs is everybody's job. This budget builds upon our commitment to social and emotional health by the request of an additional school psychologist at the secondary level as our students' needs continue to climb. Programs such as Second Step, Zones of Regulation, and our continued commitment to the Sandy Hook Promise programs are so important. Our investment in staff training in this area with mental health first aid and just last week, signs of suicide training demonstrate our commitment to mental health. For some of our students, it is these opportunities in the arts, co-curricular and athletics that provide the motivation to come to school each day. The arts, our before and after school programming, wraparound services, not only enhance our academic program, but provide that sense of belonging that many students would not otherwise have. At a time where many districts are cutting back these programs, our programs continue to thrive in Waterford and are valued as much as our core academics. Our commitment to build the capacity of our staff and ensure they have the necessary skills and knowledge to meet students' needs is a top priority. Administration and teachers work hand in hand as a team to accomplish the mission and goals set forth by this board. Whether it be developing teacher leaders, a high functioning district data team, school leadership teams, job embedded professional development, and the multitude of teacher leadership positions in our district, it is a team effort. I'm not gonna read everything on the slide, uh, but it is a lot. Uh, we have a long list of accomplishments over the last year, and the list tonight is only a representative sample of the many great things our students are accomplishing within the district, at the local, regional, state, national, and yes, sometimes international level. Under the guidance of what I consider to be the best team of professionals the district could ask for, our students and staff strive to be the best they can be. It is always meaningful when somebody else recognizes our work, whether that be CAS, NEASC, or the State Department of Education, or national outfits such as the Fund for Teachers. We lead the region and state in so many areas. Before we get to the budget details and spend the majority of the night talking about numbers, I want to thank our entire district team for their incredible and tireless efforts these last 10 months. From the demands placed on the team to flip from a traditional school district to an online distance learning academy in a matter of hours last March, to the hundreds of hours in the 70 person reopening committee this summer, to teaching to two to three and sometimes four different audiences each day, to running two different food service operations on site and food delivery, thousands of to-go meals, keeping our schools clean and safe each day, and to our support staff handling thousands of calls and emails from parents with questions. I thank our team and want everyone to know how proud I am of all that you have done and continue to do. 
I couldn't ask for a better or more committed group of people to work with each day. As we move towards the budget, one thing is for sure. This is a community proud of its schools for so many reasons. Our students come to schools from a community that supports and val values education. Our school district uses effective strategic planning, maintains a focus on results over time, and an unwavering commitment to high quality teaching and learning. We vigilantly analyze our needs and reallocate resources as you will see tonight before asking for more. We effectively negotiate employment contracts and our focus on energy and resources are high leverage research based strategies. This budget reflects the fiscal circumstances we find ourselves in and trends below our 10 year average of 1.8% budgets. On behalf of our entire team, I am proud to present the following overview of the proposed FY22 budget. As uh, the chair, Mr. Merriman said, this year the board and administration employed a new approach to the development of the superintendent's recommended budget. The Board of Ed Finance Subcommittee and administration met regularly throughout the winter months, allowing administration to update the board as the budget was in development. Every budgetary line was reviewed and methodology discussed. The board's feedback was important. All of these meetings were broadcast to the public and the videos remain on our website to provide a comprehensive overview of our budget as it was being developed in real time. Our team doesn't take our local budget allocation for granted. Our team makes every effort to contain and control costs and pursue efficiencies. Sometimes though those efficiencies are a cut in services, aggressive negotiations, a new strategy, or solving a problem in a new way. This slide contains those deliberate and strategic actions that we have saved and will save the town of Waterford tens of millions of dollars in the years to come. There has been a consistent reduction in staff and services. We've negotiated the elimination of salary lanes and the top step in the WFCT contract for new hires. We've negotiated union contracts below statewide trend. We've negotiated high deductible health plans with increasing cost shares and deductibles. We've eliminated th services such as out of town magnet busing over the last two fiscal cycles, and we terminated a magnet school agreement. We've targeted marketing to our families to reduce our magnet tuitions. We've seen a 25% reduction in five years, 27% in particular at the high school level is, is something which we should all be proud of. It has taken a conscientious effort to do so, but this is real money coming back to Waterford. Energy efficiency measures, and we continue to reduce staff, as you will see later on tonight, in alignment with enrollment trends and reduce services such as talented and gifted. One area I'm particularly proud of is the top of the slide, where grant revenues continue to increase, chasing $708,000 in the last five years and grants that we could have passed on or chose not to pursue. We continue other areas such as revenue generation, having signed three agreements with area K-8 towns to send students to Waterford High School. We've allocated 76 seats at Waterford High School to area towns, which would result in a potential revenue of $1 million to the town of Waterford's general fund. Before I explain the numbers, I wanna provide some context to the educational environment we operate in here in 2021. External factors such as unfunded mandates and reduced state and federal resources continue to try their very best to hinder our efforts. We vigorously engage our local delegation and leaders at the Capitol. Our students face unprecedented distractions and pressures like never before. Then add in the complex challenges COVID-19 has presented us, and we know resources are finite and important. I say these things not to complain, but to provide co context to our request. We see tremendous fluidity in the world in which we live. It is rapidly changing. Today's classroom is no different. The classrooms of today see higher rates of transiency, challenging student behaviors, but also students who we are challenged 
to challenge and to think differently than we did. 65% of the jobs our students will have do not yet exist. There is a greater focus on inquiry-based learning. Today's classroom requires us to approach teaching and learning in a multitude of new ways. Today's Waterford classroom is different and has changed over the last decade. The expectations on us for what we are asked to provide our students continues to increase. I offer these statistics not as numbers, but to provide an understanding of the students who come to us each day in 2021. Special education continues to hover around 20% for a number of years now. About 40% of our students receive some sort of daily intensive support, whether it be 504 services, intervention in the form of SRBI, or special education. Our English language learners population has more than doubled in recent years, with more than 15 languages spoken in our schools. Waterford students' needs have increased over the last decade, and our team has continued to address them in successful ways. What this budget accomplishes tonight, uh, and you can see the first item, is it will address needs that have been created as a result of COVID-19, and I will highlight those throughout the budget process. It does continue our strategic plan work. It will continue to provide a high quality education, maintaining current programs, offerings, and continuing reasonable class sizes. It will sustain, as I mentioned earlier, our curriculum renewal cycle, quality professional development, our arts, athletic, and co-curricular programs, and as important, continue our preventative maintenance program on our buildings. This budget is measured and mindful of the economic realities we face. And while the 1.55% is below our 10 year average of 1.8, as I mentioned earlier, it's also below the RTM's long range financial planning committee's number of 2%. This budget will still us allow us to address our students' needs. As students' needs change, the district's needs change. And while this budget is modest in its request, we do vigilantly analyze our needs and re reallocate resources. This budget sees an elimination of 4.0 FTEs in our teaching force, primarily due to decreasing enrollment. When you look at our budget request a bit deeper and factor in the revenue generated by the Board of Education that goes directly to the town general fund, the revenue offset to the budget results in a net 1.16% increase in FY22. We are projecting 16 tuition students at a tuition cost to the sending towns of just under $13,000 per student for an approximate total of just under $200,000 to the town general fund. How did we result in a 1.55 request? really boils down to four major factors. We, as I mentioned, see a result of four FTEs in our teaching force. Two of those will result in a reduction in, of, in force. Uh, we saw tremendous turnover in our paraprofessional workforce during COVID. Uh, upwards of 20 paras uh, have left us this current school year and we've hired paras at lower salaries. We also settled the para contract lower than what was budgeted last fiscal year. We've seen favorable claims experience in our health resulting in a near flat health insurance line. And we've seen historical low fuel and diesel costs. You can see we're a people organization in terms of where we spend our money. Over three quarters of our budget is salaries and benefits, which is still below the national average that hovers in the 80 to 85% range. This is not unusual. You add in tuition, another 8% for heat and utilities and transportation, also fixed costs. The remaining 8% of other are all those other line items in our budget, instructional supplies, software, textbooks, and so on. Some of which are also fixed costs and others are to address district need. One way to examine our budget is to look at the six major budget drivers in any budget. To put these budget drivers into context, I wanted to share how much these lines were increasing over FY21 and how much these lines are contributing to the overall budget increase in FY22. 
When we look at salaries and all forms of con compensation, our budget will increase approximately $300,000 over FY21. That typically uh, is in the six to $700,000 range. Employee benefits going up approximately 156,000. Those are those items above and beyond health insurance, which is relatively flat. Heat, energy, and fuel, as I mentioned, we'll see a slight decrease, mainly due to fuel oil, fuel, and diesel. Tuition, a modest increase, really, really around rates as we continue to bring more kids back to district, whether it be uh, magnet population or our special ed population. Transportation, we'll see our 3% contractual increase. All other lines in the budget, approximately a $250,000 increase much of which is in the area of software as we've uh, transitioned to a heavy uh, tech uh, heavy environment. That results in approximately a $780,000 increase to our budget or 1.55% over FY21. Now I will explain line items and budget categories in more details. As we start with instructional services, this area includes all contractual increases, for certified staff. We have reduced staff in our teaching force, as I mentioned earlier, by 4.0 FTEs. This category also supports positions to address needs created by the COVID crisis in the areas of intervention, school psychologists will also allow us to address the state and Board of Ed graduation requirement of capstone. And it also supports the addition of a human resources position for the Board of Ed recognizing the request of the town to split HR services. HR has grown increasingly complex and labor intensive throughout the course of the years. I do wanna call attention again to the low number of retirements we face in FY22. Only three and a half teachers have indicated retirement at a time where, we're, where we once trended closer nine to 10 people a year. As you know, many times we are able to capture a savings from a retiree to a new hire. It's the third year in a row of consistently uh, low retirements. We'd like to walk through staffing a little bit. While it's, it, it is a net decrease of 4.0 FTEs, uh, I actually propose in this budget the elimination of, of 10 positions. Uh, this budget would recognize three elementary classroom positions uh, being eliminated. Uh, primarily due to the uh, decreasing enrollments at certain grade levels in certain neighborhood schools. This budget does eliminate an elementary math coach, resulting in a model that is similar to what the board decided last spring, reducing elementary literacy coaches from three to two. The math model would result in two elementary math coaches. We eliminate four middle school classroom teachers, which is an entire team of teachers at the middle school, and one in math, science, English, and social studies, again, due to de declining enrollment at the middle school. We eliminate the middle school math coach. We eliminate a half of an FTE in literacy coach at the middle school as well. And we eliminate half of a technology education FTE at the high school. Probably saying, how do we go from 10 to four? Because I'm proposing other positional changes within our district. Uh, this budget supports two elementary intervention teachers, mainly due to the increased needs created by the COVID-19 crisis. We already have intervention teachers uh, in our three elementary schools and our middle school. Um, this would increase elementary intervention services by two FTEs. It does see the flip of the elimination of the literacy coach at the middle school and increasing literacy intervention at the middle school. It does see the reallocation of a middle school teacher to a high school capstone position. It does see the move of a middle school English teacher to the high school uh, we currently have a vacant 0.5 position for FY22 at the high school. We would move the middle school teacher to the high school and increase that by 0.5. That 0.5 increase at the high school in English would serve uh, a multitude of purposes, but most importantly, 
uh, intervention services. So we now we have a pre-K-12 intervention plan to deal with COVID academic skill gaps. It would also go to support capstone uh, if needed. It does see an increase of 0.5 art at the high school as we move digital photography out of the tech ed department and into the art department. Uh, Craig can in the, later on in the program can elaborate on why that is a conscious decision on our part. Um, it sees the increase of a uh, currently 0.5 technology specialist to a 1.0 net increase of 0.5. And it does see the addition of a secondary school psychologist to address the burgeoning needs of uh, the mental health side of the COVID crisis on our student population. Support services, this category represents contracted increases for all non-certified bargaining groups. There is no new staff for support services. It is level staff from FY21 to FY22. Employee benefits, health insurance, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, sees nearly no increase year over year in our budget. FICA increases slightly in proportion to the overall salary increases. All other line items reflect rate and contractual obligations. Unemployment, you will see uh, up slightly because there are two positions for which people are currently employed in, uh, resulting in two reductions in force. When we look at contracted services, uh, it is down about 53,000 in FY22 uh, with uh, instructional professional development and curriculum development level funded. We see decreased costs in special, special education services at magnet and charter schools. That would be line 330. We will no longer send a contribution to the town to support the HR office as we would be uh, separating services. Uh, that savings in this line will be used to offset the costs of the new HR position. Legal fees are down slightly anticipating less negotiation costs in FY22. Transportation, FY22 will be year five of, of a five-year contract for transportation. Uh, it is a 3% increase uh, per that contract. We will be going out to bid in FY22 uh, for a new bus contract. We are seeing favorable rates, as I mentioned, in diesel and fuel, uh, and recognizing our own van fleet continues to be a positive for us as we continue to maximize its use, keeping costs down in transportation. On the uh, non-health insurance insurances, we see some slight rate increases. We are waiting on final rates from the carrier, which usually come in February and March, usually uh, right around the time we go to Board of Finance. Who knows, they may be in sooner. On communications, a minor increase in advertising, mainly due to the requirements around formulating a publicly advertised bus bid. On tuition, this category represents the tuition we pay to public and private special education programs, state agency placements at the Waterford Country School, and Waterford students who attend magnet and charter schools. Uh, most of these placements rates go up incrementally each year. We do, as I mentioned earlier, continue to see a reduction of students attending magnet and charter schools as a result of our targeted efforts. Special education placements at private placements are slightly down next year, helping us to mitigate some of the rate increases in other tuition areas. Other purchase services, some minor increases in rates reflected in this category. We do anticipate less travel in the fall for conferences, hence a slight decrease in line 580. In line 590, contracted services, some of the increase is to support additional modules and functionality in the employee timekeeping time system to streamline some of the HR functions as we begin to set up our own department. Also in 590 is our payment to the town of approximately $74,000 for the utilization of town hall, which uh, is used for custodial services. Wanna just dive in a little bit, as I mentioned, uh, with the expansion of the functionality of the timekeeping system to realize more efficiency. Uh, it would allow us to really consolidate 
many different databases mainly housed in Microsoft Excel across the district. Uh, it would allow for an employee self-service portal. So when there's address changes, benefit changes, things of that nature, uh, employees uh, can make some of those changes uh, through a portal as opposed to uh, paper and labor intensive processes that, that we current, uh, currently have. It would allow for things such as benefit enrollment, tracking compensation, certifications and licensure, as well as substitute tracking. Our hope in the long run is that it would allow us to eliminate other pieces of software and perhaps recognize efficiencies within uh, the workforce. When we look at instructional supplies, many lines in this object are level funded or reduced as you saw in your budget book. In 440 rentals, as you can see that is up, um, with capital cut to zero last year, we do need to extend the lease on the existing bus trailer out another year. We do have a capital request to purchase and build a permanent bus trailer across the street on the high school property. Um, but uh, this is to extend the lease on the existing bus trailer. In 611 instructional supplies, you can see a slight increase. Most of that increase is due to two factors and the expansion of some student assessments. Uh, we are proposing that we uh, purchase and provide PSAT 9 for all ninth graders at Waterford High School. We feel this will provide us with valuable data and allow staff and students to prepare better for taking the SAT. It also sees uh, the administration of the OLSAT for all third graders in the district. The OLSAT uh, is an assessment that assesses a student's cognitive abilities in verbal, nonverbal, and quantitative areas that relate to his or her academic success, providing us uh, with valuable information as a universal screener to all third graders. Want to spend some time on software. The board will recognize uh, last spring, we did uh, bring to the board uh, uh, requesting uh, approval for software expenditures uh, last spring that he, now are here reflected in FY22. Uh, this increase really boils down to three major areas within software. Product rate increases on existing products representing about uh, $27,000 of the $100,000 increase. New infrastructure software to support the increased number of devices in the district. Uh, and new instructional software being used during COVID-19 that has become integral to our core program and will have a life beyond COVID. I wanna go into a little more detail on the next slide. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about device management. Uh, device management is software that allows us to restrict usage and issue new updates to uh, a mass of devices. Um, in the past where we might have um, done those things on a smaller scale or perhaps even manually. This allows us to push out updates to all devices at once, uh, including iPads. Um, it allows us uh, better inventory control. Our uh, device count uh, is up in the neighborhood of uh, increase over last year at this time, uh, you know, approaching 1,500 new devices or, or more. We're, we're essentially a one-to-one -one district now. Uh, which has been required of us with this COVID crisis. Inventory control will allow us to track devices down to the individual student level as opposed to the school and classroom level. On the instructional side, we see new tools such as Seesaw, which I would call the Google Classroom, but for younger students, writable PDF software as teachers push out assignments in PDF format. Uh, products such as Cami allow students to write on a PDF on their computer. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Zoom licenses as, uh, as we continue uh, in this uh, dual virtual uh, environment. On the operation and maintenance of building side, we do see decreases in usage of water, sewer, natural gas, and pro propane. So those aren't rate related. Those are really around usage. Uh, during the, the four meetings over the course of the winter, Mr. Mancini went into great depth around methodology, looking at you know, trend over time, and we are seeing decreased usage. So that's a good news story. Some maintenance repair items and parts have been increased to better reflect yearly actuals. 
Uh, on the maintenance supply front, we do see the purchase of two end of life sanders and uh, fuel uh, in utilities, fuel, uh, oil and electricity do see rate increases uh, coming off uh, some lows from last year. On textbooks, library books and other supplies, uh, textbooks are flat once again, no increase as we have been, been able to mitigate that to a flat line item uh, over the years with our curriculum renewal cycle and a move more towards more budget, I mean more uh, technology resources, digital resources. On 642 library books and periodicals, you do see an increase. Most, if not all of that $11,000 increase is for Waterford High School. It's really to take a hard look at our nonfiction collection. It's been uh, nearly a decade since that collection has really had a once over. And it would really allow us to increase our collection in the areas of social justice, race, bias, and topics of equity. On 690 athletic uh, supplies, this is really in, in the area of some equipment to replace an end of life swim timing system at the pool, replace an end of life batting cage, and uh, to address some increased costs in our uniform replacement cycle. Uh, one of the benefits over here over the last couple of years is that we have a, uh, much like our curriculum renewal cycle, we have a uniform renewal cycle and those ebb and flow depending on the team that is uh, replaced in any given year. On the equipment front, there is a detailed breakdown of tech purchases on page 66, but a few, a few highlights here. Uh, it does address the, our replacement cycle for end of life equipment. Uh, it does allow us for some Wi-Fi improvements as more devices are accessing Wi-Fi every day in our buildings. Again, we will see ne next fall in the neighborhood of, of 1,500 uh, new devices accessing Wi-Fi. It allows us to address print management. Many of you are familiar with the follow me concept where there are printers and copiers scattered throughout the building. The back end software that runs that uh, is no longer being supported. So it's gonna uh, uh, force us to look at a new solution. Uh, it allows us to replace some projectors um, in larger spaces such as gym and cafeterias, but it also allows us uh, 30 new projectors for Waterford High School as we await new learning boards. Uh, again, capital was zeroed out last, last year so uh, what, what had been on the replacement cycle has been delayed uh, another year. This is to really purchase uh, some kind of uh, intermediary uh, projectors for boards uh, that are just too dim. It does allow us to purchase blinds uh, for 30 classrooms at Waterford High School that really cannot see the screen during sunny times of the day. On the instructional equipment front, um, it's really to continue our microscope uh, purchasing uh, phase in. Uh, as you know, we purchased some microscopes uh, last year. This would allow us to purchase, I believe, six more microscopes and microscope cameras uh, to support our science department and support some additional uh, new equipment uh, and end of life equipment in the tech ed uh, CTE division. Dues and fees, really reflective of rate adjustments. Uh, there are no do new dues and fees. So we exit out uh, and hand it back over to the board. I mentioned grants uh, earlier in this program. This slide shows uh, our continued pursuit of grant dollars uh, that are really competitive grant opportunities. Obviously, we receive many entitlement grants uh, from the state and federal government. These are really grants that go beyond that, that really rely on staff uh, to pursue these perhaps even on their own time. Over $707,000 has been acquired over the last uh, five years. You do see a dip this year in, in grant dollars as uh, COVID has put a crunch on that, but uh, it has not deterred us. And I always look forward to sharing uh, news of these grants at board meetings. And you can see kind of the trend Five years ago, 95, we ramped up to 146, 212, 170 this year, 82. And again, grant funding down really due to the circumstances surrounding COVID. 
do want to talk a little bit about ESSER II funding, and it's really an unknown impact at, at this point. Uh, I wanted to review the entire budget proposal with you, um, but do want to mention uh, ESSER II funding that is coming to Connecticut school districts, which we were made aware of this week. ESSER stands for the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds. It is a federal program passed down through the states, and it is for school districts to address COVID-19 related expenses. Joe Mancini and I were able to participate in a webinar Tuesday afternoon with CSDE, and we are continuing to work through this. What we do know um, is that, and what they were firm about in that webinar, it is it must address COVID-19 related expenditures. But Waterford, uh, over a two year period, stands to receive one, just over $1.1 million. The actual grant application and requirements are not being released until the end of February or later, and we will have a month to submit uh, an application and proposal for funding. Uh, and they say we'll hear uh, sometime uh, in the ensuing month after that. So while we won't have the ability during the Board of Ed budget process to gauge the actual impact of our FY22 budget before Board of Ed final action, our hope is to have additional information for you in the coming weeks. As I close this out, community partnerships remain vital to what we do. We all know, and it's cliche to say, but it is true, it does take a community to educate a child. The demands in education and on children are higher than ever. And we know that maintaining community partnerships, many of which are with our town departments is so important. Our other partners are in business industry and the nonprofit world. And while it has been a year of challenges, we have much to be thankful for and proud of. On behalf of our team, we're grateful for the continued support of our parents, guardians, and families in the, in the uh, efforts they show each day with their children. We know helping your children at home uh, has been difficult over the last 10 months. We know at times it has been both probably frustrating and rewarding as you've seen your child's growth. And we know you've seen them develop in ways you wouldn't otherwise have seen had they been in school full time. And we thank our families for their help. This budget was developed in accordance with the board adopted budget assumptions in alignment with our mission, board goals and strategic plan and to meet our needs to continuously improve our educational program. I believe this proposed budget fulfills our mission, supporting high aspirations for our students and addressing their needs. Our team is proud to work in this community and we're fortunate to have a board of education that promotes and supports an environment where high quality teaching and learning can occur. I look forward to our discussion this evening. I thank you for your support and believing in our staff, students and families. And at this point, I will hand it back to the chair for budget discussion, questions and deliberations. Okay, uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you everybody for your efforts in, in putting this, this budget together. I know it's a tremendous amount of work over a period of time. Um, I also thank you for your time that uh, you and Joe took to uh, talk to the finance committee and thank the finance committee members, my peers here on the, the board. A lot of effort went into that. Um, and it just, it just shows our dedication to this. Um, and also uh, we were able, the budget was able to come in under the recommendation of the long range planning committee. That was the same recommendation the finance committee, the board of ed finance committee made uh, was 2% at, at the max, we were well under that. So we would definitely appreciate your efforts and uh, everyone's efforts all throughout this to, to uh, you know, to scrutinize the budget and keep cost in line as best we can. Um, so we will go through this uh, just section by section. Uh, if there's, uh, you know, we'll do the raising the hands as best we can and answer, uh, get to people as best we can. If there's something up on the screen, we may just have to kind of kind of shout it out and uh, let it, you know, let someone speak, let them finish, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next person that has a question or would like to. Uh, offer some suggestions. Um, so first first up will be instructional services, which is 25 million 
$44,842 to an increase of $214,522. Anybody has any questions on that? I, I do have one, Tom. Um, could you maybe uh, maybe kind of highlight the, the differences between a coach and an interventionalist, What how they differ? I know we have a reduction in, in, in coaches in places and some addition of interventionalists. I just wanted to maybe just for everyone's knowledge that they, they understand what, what the real difference between those two are. Yeah, and I'm going to call on Craig in just a second because uh, as the uh, head person of uh, teaching and learning in the district, I know he's going to give a more eloquent answer than me. Uh, two quick points. One, I also want to thank Craig for being part of those Board of, fin uh, board of Ed Finance subcommittee meetings as well. I know you didn't intentionally mean to omit them, but uh, Craig was an important part of those. Uh, I do, and I didn't mention it in my slide presentation, uh, is that uh, I am viewing the interventionist as a short-term need, whether that's one year or two years. Um, um, I'm viewing those in intervention FTEs as uh, short-term and not long-term positions in the district. As I said, we do have intervention services uh, in the district currently. Uh, we, we anticipate and, and know there'll be learning and skill gaps among students. Um, but uh, I did want to reiterate that, that, that we're, we're not seeing that as, as long-term additions to the Board of Ed budget. It's really an acute need to address COVID uh, related. And again, uh, we're still working through ESSER II funding and we'll see how that plays out. Uh, that, we'll see if that's something that can address our interventionists. But specific to your question is about the role of each. I'll ask Craig Powers uh, to address that. Thank you. Sure. So uh, <clears throat> in general, uh, interventionists uh, work with uh, children who need uh, remediated services in either language arts or math. So they're providing small group instruction uh, for uh, students who have been identified through the uh, SRBI process as needing more support. Uh, coaches, on the other hand, uh, work primarily um, in uh, professional learning as well as uh, really curriculum fidelity, ensuring that the curriculum that's uh, presented is being taught with high fidelity across uh, all grades uh, and providing uh, supports to teachers so that uh, an elementary teacher who has to juggle six different subjects daily can um, get some support going deeper into content areas um, with the help of the coaches. Okay, perfect, thank you. I didn't mean to leave you off on the, the subcommittee. <laughs> Quite all right. Um, but yeah, I just wanna make that clear just for people who don't um, understand that the, the sort of workings of those, those types of positions, what they actually do. I know we've, we've talked about these different things over time, but since they came up in the budget as, as you know, pluses and minuses, just wanna clarify that. Did, did anyone have any uh, questions related to instructional services, Marcia? Uh, I, I was on the finance um, subcommittee and um, we talked about the HR position very sparsely. So when I first heard about the new HR position, I saw it as a non-negotiable mandate by the town. As much as I want to cooperate with the town, it is contradictory to ask the Board of Ed to keep our costs down and simultaneously ask us to add an administrative position to our budget. We're cutting four teachers, people who directly work with students to manage rising costs. The first selectman's request of adding the HR director to our budget for 2021-22 will cost approximately $80,000. This will add to our bottom line every single year and establish a new department. There has to be a better solution, be it adding an additional assistant or something else. The Board of Ed should not be asked to take on this burden at this time, nor be penalized if it is forced to do so. Thank you. Thanks. If I could just briefly comment on that, Mr. Oh, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Benvenuti, for, for your comments. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we've seen, and in, in, in while this request uh, 
did come from this first selectman. One of the things that I've seen over the six years is, is the current model is not necessarily sustainable. Uh, the, the requirements in HR uh, continue to increase exponentially. Um, and, and I'll give you an ex a quick example. Um, you know, several years ago when, when we hired a new person, uh, we might go back two or three employers. Um, a state statute was passed that we now have to go back to every employer uh, where an employee had any interaction with children. So we could hire a uh, teacher from another district, perhaps in a high needs area, physics, Latin, French, whatever, um, in their 30th year, um, obviously a later in career individual. And we're required to go back to, uh, all the way back to when they were a camp counselor. That could be 40 more years or more. Um, so that's just one example of how legislative impact affects us at the local level. Uh, layer on top of that, the complexities around FMLA and ADA and, and, and 504 accommodations for staff, uh, collective bargaining, labor relations, uh, it, it is complex. Um, so, uh, HR performs a, a certain function, uh, obviously a, a vital function, uh, and just wanted to layer on that 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 it is a, a necessary department and a necessary function, for sure. And I, I know that's not what you were arguing, so. <laughs> my, my basic point is, do we really need a director or would a, this an additional assistant or some other way to, to mitigate this, this overburdened um, person's um, workload? You know, if, if there's another way to look at it, maybe we, sh we should look outside the box or do something. But another administrative position is definitely a big ticket item that will last forever. That's all. Uh, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Greg, this is Joy Goggin. I just have a quick question. Please. Yeah, of course. On page seven, where it lists all the staffing changes for the high school capstone teacher, mm -hmm. is that a separate line item in page eight through 14? Or am I, is it included in Waterford High School teachers? I, I don't see it separated out. Yeah, that's a great a great question, Joy. It, it is included, I think, particularly uh, in the social studies department uh, at Waterford High School. Uh, we anticipate as we eliminate teachers at the middle school um, that we would uh, move a social studies teacher to the high school. Any content area certification can teach capstone. Uh, it is a designated course. We look forward to bringing that curriculum and construct to the board probably in in April, um, we have a developed job description. Mis Mr. Uh, Hauser is on the call and can certainly uh, speak to uh, the role of Capstone if needed, but it is uh, within the social studies department line at the high school. Oh, okay, great. Cause my, I wanted to make sure that it was a certified teacher in that role. Yes. So that's very helpful, thank you. Uh, Michelle, go ahead. Um, I'm just trying to connect the dots, and I think you said this, but um, the technology, there, there's a um, no funds here for a technology coordinator at the high school, and you just referred to a 0.5 technology. Are those linked? Yeah, so... Uh, we, we, in this budget, it proposes reducing uh, tech ed teaching time at the high school by 0.5. Um, we currently have a 0.5 tech specialist servicing middle and high. Um, we, uh, this budget would support moving that from 0.5 to 1.0 uh, with the reduction of 0.5 in tech ed at the high school. And really the reason and rationale around that is, is a couple, and, and again, Craig Powers can elaborate if needed, is we're going to see 1,500 more devices in our schools every day next year. Um, 
it, it is going to be di a different experience. Right now, teachers are teaching to basically two different audiences or three, really. Uh, you have the kids in front of you in the classroom. You have cohort B who might be home, and then you have full distance learners, kids, kids who, who aren't coming to school at all. Next fall, hopefully all goes well. We're back, you know, full in. It's going to be a different experience for a teacher to have 20 plus students in front of them all with a device. And, and our goal is to make sure those devices are used meaningfully and not a, my word, a glorified homework device. And that wouldn't be anybody's fault. That's where, you know, uh, the tech specialist, again, which is an existing position. We have 1.0 at the elementary right now, 0.5 at the secondary. Uh, and we're, we're gathering that by reducing tech ed teaching time at the high school. So then on page nine, technology coordinator at the high school, there's zero. That's yeah, I'd, ha I'd have to defer to Joe to see what, like, I believe there's a tech specialist line. I do. Joe, do you know what page that is on? I'm looking. Yeah, because I heard you saying it. I just can't find it. And then this one I see is zero, so. I thought that one was eliminated a couple of years ago, though. Let me just see. So there is no tech coordinator. No, no. Okay. there was there was a position that was eliminated probably at least two years ago, maybe three. Yeah, technology coordinator uh, WHS that was eliminated uh, midway maybe four through years ago. Year Twenty, yeah. And so now, right. so and now well, we just have tech ed teachers. Correct. And then we have the support in terms of technical, we, um, we have the support from an admin position that I think I saw somewhere. Okay. We'll get back to you on the exact line, which line the tech specialists are in. Thank you. I might find it. <laughs> uh, Chris, go ahead, please. Uh, our questions now, they're just, <clears throat> excuse me, under instructional services from K-7 to 14, is that correct? So that's the only thing yeah. we're, we're going over now, is that right? At, at, at the moment, yep. Okay. Uh, okay. All set? Okay. Yeah, I just need a half a second. Okay. Um, I didn't see any more hands, so um, <clears throat> let's move on to support services, right? Uh, Six million seven ninety three four zero four. That's an increase of eight eighty seven thousand five seventy one. Any? Yes, Chris. Sorry. I, I was hoping to buy time. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's all right. Before we moved on. So, yep. sorry. No, so, no uh, I'll get to it. Is, okay. Can you tell me about the services of the library or the media center on what you call it for the five schools? That's my first question. I don't know if I should ask Tom or if you want me to direct that to Mr. Powers or however you want to work it. Yeah, I'll give the 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 thirty thousand foot view and just for to go back to uh, Michelle Devine's question, tech specialists are on page eight, about eight lines up. They're called technology specialists. So we took care of that one and crossed it off the list. Uh, generally speaking, um, Chris, uh, the setup, and then um, Craig can maybe go into a little more detail around role if needed. Our three elementary schools uh, all have a uh, secretarial position uh, running the library. Uh, middle school has a secretarial uh, bargaining unit employee. And at the high school, we have a certified library media specialist. That is a position within the WFCT. It's a Connecticut teaching certification, uh, as well as a uh, library assistant, which is a position within the secretarial unit. So that's that's the construct of what's present in each of the uh, media centers in the district. What is the difference from 
what the positions that happen at the middle school and the elementary schools, how is that different from the high school? Yeah, I think Craig and Andre would do that justice. Craig, maybe you first, then hand it off to sure. Andre. Yeah, so um, uh, the, the one librarian we have now um, really does coordinate with the five schools when it comes to you know, looking at the collection and if, if they need to review for uh, updating their orders. Um, so the librarian can, can kind of assist with that. And then the library technical assistants, which Tom said are in the secretarial union, really uh, do the day-to-day -day operation of checking books out, shelving them, uh, keeping the library in order. Um, the librarian at the high school uh, then also works with uh, various uh, departments, um, probably primarily English and history, but not exclusively uh, on uh, researching. And um, we also have a number of uh, online subscription services. So if a teacher is saying I'm teaching this unit, the librarian can really uh, help provide some, uh, you know, nonfiction resources uh, to uh, aid in those uh, lessons. Uh, Andre, what did I miss? Well, actually um, you gave a really good quick summary of the, what the high school librarian does to support the elementary libraries and the middle school library. Those are the parts of the librarian services they call library and collection management. Um, basically running a library similar to what you would expect say, of a town library. Um, what's different at the high school level is the direct and indirect support both to teachers and to students in um, instruction and research. And I really wanna emphasize research here because that is a, a huge part of what the librarian does. Um, <clears throat> many, many times our teachers who are planning a unit um, will need a lot of background information for it. And so they'll work with, um, the librarian to really curate a collection of, of credible information, good resources for them. Um, and then from there, that goes on to direct support for teachers, very often working one-on-one -on -one or one-on small group with teachers um, to help them plan instruction or to actually co-plan instruction that he's going to then deliver. Um, in 2018-19, which was the last typical school year we had, um, our librarian worked with over 20 teachers designing lessons or units for over 60 classes. Um, uh, Craig mentioned that a lot of this work is with uh, our humanities, but it's actually expanding out from that. Um, one of the big projects last year was actually working with our biology department to boost scientific literacy skills for students at different reading levels. Then there was direct instruction and support to students. Um, and that comes in a number of different ways. There's what we call reader's advisory, working one-on-one -on -one with students to direct them, to help them select books and resources tailored to their interests and needs. Um, he also provides an, a library orientation for all ninth grade classes, teaches all of our UConn ECE students and teachers how to use the UConn library for college level research. Um, and, and comes in as a, a guest teacher in a lot of classes um, to provide tailored research instruction um, for students. Uh, we really anticipate that part of the job mushrooming next year with the incorporation of our capstone project because all of our juniors will be doing a re an independent research project on a topic of their choice that will be somewhere between a semester and a full year long and we really are embedding a large research component in here and we anticipate a, a, a huge need to support them in, in that personalized research process. I, I forget, so just help me understand. The capstone piece, is there going to be or is there a capstone instructor for this? Yes. Um, Remember, we've got that teacher coming over that's going to be housed in our social studies department to give us one more full-time equivalent of teaching time. We actually anticipate a need for more than that um, to be able to fully support our capstone project. Uh, 
so we'll be also taking a few teachers here and there from other departments potentially to be the actual teacher in the classroom working with those students but we so, need the librarian to support that independent research beyond the classroom so when these students are doing the capstone project is the capstone teacher going with them to the library or are, is the capstone teacher sending the students on their own to the library? Um, we're still fleshing out the curriculum a little bit for it, but I would imagine there will be times when a whole class will go to the library. There will be times when independent students, Greg? I think it's important just to uh, clarify when we say capstone, it's important to say that there'll be a capstone course for which Andre is saying that maybe a whole class will be coming down, but then there'll be a half credit that will be conferred by the student doing a capstone research project for which the, the student most likely would be working with the librarian one-on-one. -on -one. How, how is what's different in terms of, let's say the purchasing of textbooks or excuse me, the purchasing of books for the library different from the other four schools to the high school? When someone at Great Neck or someone in Quaker Hill that is working there, if they say, hey, we want to purchase these books, how does that work versus at their school versus the high school? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, the library technical assistants can certainly order their own books. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we try to ensure that there's uh, equity amongst the schools, uh, like, I've asked the librarian services to actually go to each elementary, work with the library technical assistant, look at the collection, and for him to recommend what areas might need to be bolstered up. Because otherwise, you, you might just have, you know, one person who has a passion for something, bolster their collection in that something. And, and that might not be translated across the district. So it's really that, that quality control piece. Um, plus, you know, from a NIAS perspective, uh, you know, library information services is um, one of the effective indicator practices. So uh, historically, Waterford has had three certified librarians, uh, one to oversee the three elementaries, one at the middle school and one at the high school. And over the years, uh, two of those three positions have been eliminated. Uh, I think by uh, any further reduction, uh, we would be criticized uh, from the accreditation uh, organization on top of all the good work that we're saying that this position brings. Yes, that's accurate. Um, with the NEASC, that would be considered a substantive change in our programming, which we would need to report to them. So you have the library person, you have the person that's the, in the secretary's union, that's the library assistant at the high school. Mm -hmm. And then you will have the person that's doing their capstone. So there's three people that are in the library. Is that right? No, no, no. The capstone teacher will be teaching a bona fide course. They'll have a full teaching load of a capstone course. So well, I got it, but yep. you have a take out the capstone person. You have the library person and this second position that's in the library at the high school. So there's two. Yes. Correct. And, and that's needed. Yes. Um, for us to be able to have the librarian um, going out and teaching classes and co-planning with um, <clears throat> teachers throughout the building, we need to have somebody who's able to be in the library doing those library uh, uh, management um, and basically student supervision. We do average in a normal year, at least, um, about 40 to 50 students through the library every single semester. <coughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, if I could maybe piggyback on Mr. Jones' point, um, the, at, at the high school, we have a, certi a person who's a certified teacher for our li librarian, and they're also certified as a librarian as well? Yes. Okay. Um, is, that, is that a requirement by the state or is that just a, a bonus for us, essentially? I mean, because, I mean, based on what you've, you've said, it, 
it's extremely helpful to have someone who's a certified teacher who can teach classes and certify as a librarian and, and you know do a great job there. But I'm just trying to understand is that is that any sort of uh, is that sort of any sort of mandate on the high school anyway? It, it, well, as I said, it's it's a it's a part of the NEASC review. Right. Um, many schools have librarians in, in all levels. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I know the Friendship School had a, a certified librarian uh, for pre-K and kindergarten. Um, so, you know, uh, I can't answer if it's a state requirement mm -hmm. uh, or not, um, Craig. Right. No, I, I, and, uh, you know, and from what, what you've all said, I mean, it's, it's very beneficial to us to have a person of his... Uh, his skill and quality uh, in, that, in that position. So I just wanted to see if there were any sort of mandate. Uh, is there any anything else, anyone? Yeah, Craig, it's Joy Goggin again. Yes, please. I have a comment and then a question. My comment is I also would like to consider an alternative to a full-time HR administrator, especially if we're going to an electronic solution like success factors or Oracle, uh, I'd, I'd like to look at other options besides that. My question then is under buildings and grounds, I see two full-time named director and supervisor. I know I should know this, but can someone explain to me uh, what what the difference is and, and why we have two? Sure. So we're now, uh, Mr. Chair, I, uh, is that under say, this? It comes section? a little later. If, if you want to, do you want to just wait until we, we get to that section, maybe? Do you mind, Joy? We are on that section. It's page we are. 13. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, uh, we have Mr. Miner on here, our director of building and grounds. Uh, I'll give you the again the thirty thousand over foot uh, thirty thousand foot overview. And if there's more specific questions uh, around that, first of all, building and grounds is a shared service with the town. So I don't know the total number of building I'm, buildings. I'm sure Jay can can answer that. But uh, obviously, we have five school buildings. Uh, they are large facilities. But in terms of really differentiating the role, uh, you know, the director is is obviously going to oversee the entire operation. Um, uh, project management, uh, working with the vendors on specking out very technical aspects, negotiating vendor contracts, things of that nature, uh, working, you know, project management as far as the maintainers. Uh, the building and grounds supervisor, kind of the number second in the command, is really managing some of the day-to-day -day, uh, custodial uh, work in the district. Um, you know, uh, it is uh, typically a working position doing some of the physical labor, you know, that's out there as well. Um, you know, more boots on the ground uh, type of thing. And, and Jay, you're going to do a, a better job quantifying that than me. Well, well a actually, that's exactly what I was looking for. Okay. Um, it's because I wasn't sure if it was a shared service with the other town buildings. And so that's, that was very helpful. Great. So, Thank you. Craig, to the chair, and I say the chair so you don't think I'm speaking to Craig Powers, no disrespect. I thought we were doing when I asked you just instructional services and I don't care what we're doing so we're also now doing support services as well I thought when I asked you you said we were doing eight to 14 which is instructional yeah we, we did kind of we did kind of jump back to that but um and I, I jumped ahead and you said you needed more time so we kind of got them got them mixed together there so I apologize all right so we're we're in support now um sure Six million seven ninety three four hundred four, which is an increase of eighty seven thousand five seventy one. Tom, do you feel like you have enough Paris? It's a good question. I'll talk a little bit about methodology, and, and we have Kathy Valone, our director of special services, on here if needed. But 
with the exception of the computer lab paras at the elementary level, uh, and there are uh, three of them, and they're really in charge of, of the instruction in those computer labs. Um, we have uh, some paras who help out uh, in intervention. Uh, beyond those, I think it's six people, everybody, all the other paras in the bargaining group are really based on student IEPs of special education students and whether or not they've been identified through the PPT process as needing para support. So when we budget paras, we're really budgeting all the way down to the IEP student level. So you might recall last budget uh, cycle for, for this current school year, FY21, I, I think it saw an increase of seven or eight uh, paras. I'd be able to tell you that exactly off of page 20, I believe. So yeah, last year saw uh, an increase of eight paras, really, because we we budget on the student IEP level. Um, we, we don't have regular classroom helpers uh, that some districts might have. So the answer to your question is yes. Are the, are the tutors separate from the paras? I forget. And the reason that I'm asking that question is when you talked about improvements in the scores, I guess, are you taking into account the tutors? And I guess, do you have enough tutors? And I'm told that many parents are getting their own tutors, especially in the arena of math. So is that something that you need to increase in the tutor parent world? And I'm lumping my question all into one. So to recap, tutor, para, parents getting their own uh, tutor for math. Is it worth our while to increase the number of tutors or paras so we can offer that to parents so they're not paying for their own? I know Craig Powers wants to jump yeah. in. So um, when we're talking about the additional intervention teachers, they would serve that role that parents are privately paying for tutors to provide remediated services in math. So that's, that's the staffing uptick that we did uh, because we know that COVID has had an impact on learning. Um, paraprofessionals are really assigned um, for special education needs, um, which could be academic but uh, when, when parents are really saying they're needing tutors, it, it's, it's probably beyond the special ed component. And that's what our interventionists would serve. When we do tutors in our budget, it's usually for uh, homebound services. Uh, if uh, children um, uh, are having uh, anxiety issues and, and can't come to school, or uh, if they are, have been expelled and they needed uh, some a compensatory education. Thanks. Tom, did you wanna say something? No, uh, Craig answered it uh, perfectly. Uh, uh, I would love to see us do a better job or look at how we can improve and communicate to parents and families the world of the tutor, the that position so parents know that we have this option and if that includes adding something into this so people know you don't have to go out and get your own tutor here's what we have and here's what we're doing because I think that's important and I don't think that's being communicated to people. Thank you. Uh, go ahead uh, Marcia. Chris uh, just excuse me Mr. Chair, through you to Chris. Sure. Uh, I don't think, uh, I think what you're saying is that um, the tutors are individual tutors for students in need. The interventionist is there and that is determined through a school process, I believe, where a parent needs a, an individual tutor for their child. They should go to the school and say, is my child in need of this? And uh, and what can we do about an interventionist or something like that? But uh, as far as the town paying for individual tutors, 
when the parent decides that there's a need for the child without any other backup with the school system, I think that's out of line. I mean, everybody could say, I need a tutor for my kid. And that's not a function of our school system. If you go through the proper processes and, and go ahead and say, okay, now we've determined this child is in need of some more services, it might be a tutor, it might be an interventionist, it might be a lot of other things, but it's not gonna be a private tutor at home um, sort of thing that you're talking about. I, I'm not proposing, uh, let me clarify. <laughs> I'm not proposing a private tutor. What I'm proposing is we do a better job communicating services that we offer, whether that's through, and I'm speaking big terms, an after school program, kids are staying after, some sort of way that if people are feeling like their students are struggling, that we're saying to people, here are the options we offer, not for an individualized service, but for the broad spectrum and for everyone. That's what I'm saying. If I, if I did not clarify that, then I apologize. But I mean, and again, in a big picture, if there's an after school program or the teachers are staying from three to four or two to three, we should be saying to people, the teachers are staying from two to three, this is the time that your child can stay after to utilize those helps of the para, the teacher, the interventionist, or whomever. That's what I was saying. And if I didn't clarify that, I apologize. Tom, could I just add one thing? This is Kathy Vallone, Special Services. Um, we do run a tutor center at the high school. And so if a student, uh, student or uh, parent comes to uh, administration or a teacher at the high school and talks about a need that would be assessed through uh, the care team and they would make a decision about whether the student was in need of having this tutor support time and there is tutors in a um, location in the high school and they work with students to support them in any class that they're taking that's been deemed appropriate. So um, we are running that at the high school and we do make it available depending upon student need. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Michelle, you had a question? I did um, and I'm still Sorry, I'm still trying to understand this all. But um, so uh, I understand the learning through service um, has gone and it's now part three different type positions. I have, I watched all the financial committee videos, just so you know, I wrote lots of notes. Um, <laughs> but um, in school suspension, Perkins and LTS, three things. Um, and then there was some clarification given to us on that. Can you tell me uh, what needs to be negotiated with, what is F WFCT? That stands for the Waterford Federation of Classroom Teachers. That's the, the teachers union. Oh, okay. So the Perkins is money that we bring back? It, yeah, the Perkins is a, is a uh, I believe it's a state grant, might even be, I think it's federal money run through the state to support our career and technical education programs at the high school. There's a, a good deal of legwork that goes into writing the grant, uh, monitoring the grant. You have to have a CTE council, things of that nature. Uh, that body of work right now is being done by the ISS LTS Perkins position. And for all that work that it sounds like is being done it looks like it's only a positive of maybe a couple thousand. Is that and the accurate? total grant on Perkins, I, I believe Craig Powers uh, can maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's in the neighborhood of, or Andre, we have Andre on the call. I believe it's about 20, it's about a 20, $22,000 grant. Oh. Last year's grant allocation was just over $24,000. We haven't gotten an exact amount for this year yet, but we anticipate it being in the same ballpark. And if you didn't accept the Perkins grant, because I know that you don't have to, what do you lose? Uh, we lose funding for that amount of funding for whichever career technolo technology education um, strand we've dedicated it to for that year. 
we potentially would also knock ourselves out of the running for um, future year grants. So basically, Michelle, uh, you would see if we didn't have a Perkins grant, the equipment line for Waterford High to include uh, some equipment for the tech ed department, which is really now being offset through the Perkins grant. Okay. Um, Thank Chris, you. Please. Tom, you, you sent us an email that said, and I don't have the date, it says the Perkins grants $1,200, $1,237. No. What I meant by that is a portion of the position paid out of the grant totals $1,200. So $1,200 is, is taken out of the grant to pay a portion of the position's overall salary. So we write off a portion of the salary to the grant, which is not unusual. So this ISS LTS Perkins position out of the total salary, only $1,200 is coming out of the salary, offsetting the salary, not the amount that you just spoke of. Is that correct? Correct. So it's a, call it a $24,000 grant, $1,300 of the 24,000 we use to offset the um, compensation for the position. So am I correct in saying that this line item under support services for that position is 58,000? Uh, it's the total of whatever I can look at it real quick. 58,707 if I remember right. I believe. Or 57,470 out of the Board of Ed operating grant. Is that correct? Yep, the total, total compensation for the position is 58,707 for FY21. And there's only one position like this in the district? Correct. Is there a position, what is the difference from this position to the ISS? Let me back up. Are there ISS positions at the elementary schools? No. Is there an ISS position at the middle school? Yes. Since we're under support services, what is the pay for the ISS position at the middle school? Rough numbers, I believe it's 34895 if my memory is good. I'm getting into budget mode here. <laughs> so uh, in, in the position, and I know I have Mr. Sachs on here, Mr. Sachs and, and Mrs. Moore, the administrators at the middle school, ha have done a marvelous job over the years really expanding the role of that position to be really uh, another set of hands in the intervention world. Um, so it's really functions as ISS, um, and intervention services. And it, again, we can elaborate on that if needed. Mr. Sachs is on. I, I'm, I'm good with that unless he wants to. Well, I will say that um, she has um, been extremely helpful during the virtual period, but she, she really merged from going from a pure ISS person to a, an instructional tutor and interventionist. She works with some very difficult kids and she does a marvelous job and um, her, her job description actually is half tutor, half um, ISS. So it will change in a given week, but right now she's almost into 100% tutor. Tom, why is there such a stark difference in salary from the middle school to the high school position? Yeah, so in, I believe it was July of 19, the ISS position at the high school uh, became vacant. The person uh, moved on to other employment. So we had a vacancy in ISS. And as an efficiency, uh, uh, at that time, we had a standalone LTS Perkins position. So, and we had an ISS position, two positions. ISS position at the high school became vacant. Uh, and um, through talks with the high school, um, I said to the high school as an efficiency measure, uh, ISS is going to be combined with LTS and Perkins into uh, one position. Uh, and that was reflected last budget cycle. So when I presented this time last year, that was reflected in the FY21 budget. You sent us something and we asked you when we talked about this last year about streamlining this LTS position. And if I see correctly, you mentioned something about some sort of software at about $1,800. Is 
to streamline the LTS position. So if you get this software and you streamline it where students are using this software, why would you need this position at such a high amount? Couldn't you stipend out the position and using the software? And then this is not a union position, is it? Uh, not currently. It's not, no, not a, not a union position. So we're not, um, we're not covered or we don't have the umbrella of contract issues or because uh, it's not a union position, correct? Correct. Uh, so yes, I, I know, uh, Mr. Uh, obviously LTS has been paused during uh, the pandemic. Uh, I know in the background, we're getting ready to launch mobile serve, which will be software and a phone app for kids to log and really streamline uh, that process. Again, moving from paper to a more digital environment. And, you know, uh, we're going to launch that next fall, assuming LTS is uh, back next fall as, uh, you know, public health conditions uh, warrant. Um, so the, the paperwork data entry end of things will be streamlined uh, next year. I just don't see, <clears throat> I, excuse me, I just don't see the need for this position when it could possibly be stipend out for less money and you could put uh, a para or a uh, whomever at a lower amount. Is that something that could be done to save the board money? Obviously the amounts would have to be negotiated, but if, if this position was scaled back, uh, there's a bot, there is a body of work even with the software to be done. Um, uh, if that was the direction the board wanted to go, uh, we administration would be tasked with figuring out a way for that body of work to be done. My guess is probably uh, a stipend with NWFCT and that amount would, would have to be negotiated. Is that something that you can look into for us and give us more info? What specifically would, it, it's legal to do. Uh, currently the, the LTS ISS Perkins position is independently contracted. Um, I'm happy to provide any further clarification, but I'm unclear exactly what you want me to get back to the board on? If this is something that instead of having this position at 58,000, and I'm not even factoring in what the fringe benefits are for this position, I'm sure I'd have to look at all these emails. I'm sure it's gotta be worth a, a, a significant amount of money is looking into scaling back this position and maybe making them separate that it's a stipend and maybe a para goes into the ISS position. Uh, I, I thought. In terms of uh, managing the ISS room with a para, that, that would be moving it to bargaining unit work and we would have to negotiate that as a new position with the power unit. Okay. And I, and I think mobile, I don't, I don't know anything about the mobile serve software, but I, like you, I think you're indicating there's a certain administrative as, aspect to that, whether, you know, it's user management, uh, running reports, collecting data and, and making sure everything is running as it should. So I, I don't know what sort of time involvement it was with that, but I know having worked, being a software engineer, I know some of those things can get the keep someone pretty busy. Yeah, absolutely. Even with the software, there's going to be a body of work that still has to be done. Like there still needs to be somebody doing something. Yes. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any other questions on the support services? And, and just uh, to support what Chris was saying about math tutors, I know I've, I've heard that same concern prior, even prior to COVID. And then uh, we, we had one of our kids uh, take it with a math tutor a few years ago, um, going between from middle school to high school, we just wanted to get her a little ahead of the game. So anyway, that, that concern has been out there before. Uh, so if there's, if there's nothing else, 
their uh, next section is employee benefits in the amount of 8,139,692, which is an increase of 156,900. Any questions? Nothing on that. Next is contracted services in the amount of 1,704,958, which is a reduction of 52,289. Anything on that? Next is transportation, the amount of uh, 2,488,513. That's an increase of $48,389. Any questions on that? Page 29 and 30. Next would be insurance, the amount of 244,967. It's an increase of uh, 5,575. Anybody? Next is uh, sections communications. That's on page 33 and 34. 95,533, increase of $2,336. Anybody? Okay. Next is tuition. Page 30, starting in 35, it's in the amount of $2,493,897. It's an increase of 12162 Anything on that? Questions? Uh, Michelle? Not for this budget, um, but how, I, I'm thinking future, I guess. Um, who negotiates and how do you negotiate uh, these costs that are adding up for Waterford Country School in a few different categories? Um, and uh, how do you, who negotiates that? So we have Kathy Valone on the call where those costs yeah. come from. So uh, there's, you know, some students we send to Waterford Country School as part of their special education placement. Other ones are sent there by the state and because the shelter's in Waterford and Kathy can explain why we have to pick up the tab sometimes for that. Um, but Kathy can certainly provide uh, some thoughts around where those amounts come from. Sure, those are, um, this is Kathy Valone. Uh, those are based on student IEP needs. Uh, the rate is set by the state so um, there is not a negotiation in the rate, daily rate, that is a preset amount. Um, and then the, but the services that are offered um, vary according to a student's um, needs and IEP. Um, there are students who are no nexus students. Those are determined no nexus by the Department of Children and Families. That means um, their parents might be deceased. Uh, there may be a parent in jail. Uh, there may be parents living out of state, and it, by the fact that they are in the shelter in Waterford, they become our responsibility, and we would be responsible for paying for their programming uh, while they were at the shelter. And is it 18 and under, or do they increase that to 21? If a student is determined eligible to stay beyond um, their high school years, then the new, it is now that they stay till their birth, their 22nd birthday. And that was changed in this school year. So they no longer end at 21. We now keep them until 22, and this 22nd is birthday. Through DCF? That could be any student that is found eligible 
that meets the requirements for continuing services until uh, beyond high school. But I think what maybe what you were asking, uh, Michelle, is how do kids end up there? Is it typically by DCF placement? Mm -hmm. Do you mean at Waterford yeah. Country School? Yes. yes. Okay, um, not always. We sometimes uh, place a student at Waterford Country School based on their specialized needs. And uh, sometimes- I'm Sorry, I'm talking about the no nexus, I guess, or- Oh, um, the so no nexus, not... right. No nexus students may be placed by DCF in a foster home in Waterford, or they could be placed by DCF in a shelter in Waterford. But that is a DCF placement. I can tell you I've engaged legislatures, uh, legislators about that. I, I think that's unfair to the local municipality uh, just because we house the shelter. Um, I have not been successful uh, in, in, in that, <laughs> but it, it is something I continue to advocate for. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in exploring that a little bit more for the next budget session or season, not this session, season. And just to see, you know, how many of those students um, are, you know, coming placed there by DCF or no nexus or just, okay, thank you. That's, that's been a concern for, that comes up quite often. Uh, I'd say just about every year, it's, uh, at least that I've been involved with the board. So. <laughs> Thank you. And I would say um, Tom and I have spent some significant time talking with legislation, legislatures around this topic um, and whether the state would be responsible to take over costs. But um, that really hasn't changed. That hasn't changed at all at this point in time. Well, it'd be nice if there's some sort of offset or something. So there, if there's nothing further on that, we've got uh, next section is on, starts on 42 is other purchase services, services at 366,899, which is an increase of 55,642. Yes, sir. I hope I'm in the right section, but is the bus rental bus garage? Oh, it, 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 that's my question. Am I in the right cat, uh, category? I think that's coming up. I'm not, uh, let me see. I don't want to speak. I believe rentals is. Joe, help on rentals. I'll throw it out real quick. Can I throw it out? To the yeah, team? sure. Throw it out. It, it's <laughs> under 440, but go on, please. <laughs> Do we have to build this trailer or have a trailer for the bus garage? Can we put them somewhere inside the school instead of the trailer to save us a little money? That's my question. I tried that two years ago. Um, the, the, they really want to have a bus lot, I'm sorry, a bus office right next to the buses. Um, I mean, we can revisit it and see if there's room within the high school. There, there's nothing in the, the adjacent J building, um, but we can continue to look at it. I, I, I don't think that that's the best course. I think the best course is just to put up a, put up that, that, that structure in the parking lot and they'll be there for, for 15, 20 years. Okay. But, I, I, I thank you, Joe. Chris. I'm good. I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So that will bring us to uh, page 45, which is instructional supplies. The amount of $938,046, which is an increase of $130,116. Any questions on that? Okay. 
and uh, we'll, we'll move on to page uh, 50, which is the operation and maintenance of buildings. In the amount of $2,077,739, which is an increase of $71,821. Questions on that section. Uh, Craig, Pat Fedor. Yes, please. Um, the first line with the Great Neck water, since Great Neck has taken abuse over the years on their excessive use of water, I think it should be duly noted that they're going down. So I hope that it requires or it gains the same amount of attention throughout the budget season. So good luck. <laughs> yeah, Marsha's sprinkler was broken this year. So. <laughs> Duel, I knew duly that was noted, the problem. <laughs> So it wasn't the swimming pool then, right, Marsha? No, no. Uh, okay. They okay. always blame the garden. <laughs> it was an easy out for us. <laughs> That's quite, quite a garden. That's impressive. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so if there any any questions at all on this section? No? Okay. It takes us to textbooks, library books, and other supplies. It's on page 60, 60 uh, in the amount of 390,879. It's an increase of 24,070 dollars. Uh, Michelle. Um I have, I had a question, you answered it. It was about the textbooks for the district um, in terms of you were not able to purchase the items this year due to COVID and um, changes. So my question is you had it budgeted for 125 this current year and you have it budgeted 125 next year and that's to purchase. But that 125 that potentially is unspent, is that going back to the town? Right, so that'll so be- we're, we're asking again for that amount of money to cover books and, um, or textbooks or whatever they are, but that 125 or roundabout, whatever you didn't spend went back to the town. It will on June 30th. On June 30th. At, at the end of the fiscal year, that'll turn be turned back to the town general fund. So they really can't cut us. <laughs> <laughs> We're giving money back. All right. Okay. Like a, in a normal year, if, if we had already done the work and we knew what we were going to spend it on, um, I would do what's called encumber it, which is basically a preservation of fund balance. So in other words, we wouldn't be, be, be sending that back to the town because we, we've identified what we're going to spend it on. But you're not going to be in that position until next April. So um, you got to release it and send it back to the town. Okay. All right, we're good there. Anything else? Uh, sorry, I have one other question. No, don't be um, sorry. Yeah, it. The library, the middle school, um, it, you know, I saw again your budgets and why, you know, the middle school has. Um, I understand the high school and the amount of money that is needed at the high school with capstones and work and all of that. The middle school, I guess I'm struggling with the amount of money that um, goes into magazine subscriptions and um, all of that stuff. And I don't doubt that our children need that and, and need to be reading and, and learning. Um, but it's I'm not hearing that the library is being utilized, obviously not during COVID, but even prior to that. Um, and so it, if it's not being utilized and we're buying more potentially subscriptions or magazines or, you know, that type of, of stuff, uh, it's being used in the, in the classrooms why wouldn't it be under maybe textbooks or classroom supplies instead of library? 
I know. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Sachs on here. I, again, I, I think he'll be able to articulate that uh, library is an integral part of life at the middle school. Uh, I think you're just talking specifically around the $9,500 a year. Uh, mm -hmm. Used to be higher than that. Uh, with that said, um, it is a place that's busy. I, I think they did somewhere around 10,000 checkouts from March to March. But Jim, why, don't, why don't you talk a little bit about sure. library? Sure. So it, it is used in, in a typical year. Um, teachers bring students down there. Um, they, the librarian creates sets of books for classrooms to use. And as far as the subscriptions, we used to actually have that managed through departments, but it just made so much more sense to have the library with her various services that she was subscribing to uh, sort of coordinate all of that. So even though we we cut that budget by almost uh, three or $4,000 in the past four or five years, we were able to really whittle down the most important subscriptions that uh, the teachers are using in the classroom. Beth manages all of those. And uh, they are absolutely used on a regular basis in teaching. Um, so I, th I think the $9,500 is well worth uh, what the students get out of it. And the, and the library in a typical year is quite a busy place. There's students there every period. Um, they're checking out books constantly. Probably next year, it'll be around 12,000 titles that'll be checked in and out. So I hope that helps. Thank you for explaining that it got moved out of the teachers and into the library. That makes sense. Great. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. That brings us to equipment in the amount of 30, $344,140. With an increase of twenty four thousand eight hundred and twenty four, um, I I do have a question here, and it's probably directed at uh, at Ed. Uh, I I see we have there's fifteen thousand in there for Wi Fi improvements. With the amount of uh, network traffic, I assume we we expect when when we go back full in. Um, How's the network looking from from you know from a Wi-Fi perspective and as far as load on the system is concerned? I mean, I, I, I assume I assume when it was built out, it was built to you know handle is it can handle what's thrown at it. I just you know don't know what kind of capacity they have. Yeah, we've actually been hitting some some peaks um, on our on our limit, so we're we're looking at. Uh, it's, it's kind of all over the place. There's some days when it's really quiet and doing nothing. And then there's other days that it's fine. And then there's certain days that we, we run into some trouble. So uh, we're ac actively looking at the, uh, we know where the bottleneck is when that happens. It's, it's actually the firewall. The wireless system is, um, it's, it's in pretty good shape other than it needs a couple little um, tweaks, but the, uh, we're kind of bumping into the, as far as the bandwidth goes, um, it's a firewall and we're looking at possibly making some adjustments to the hardware and uh, possibly increasing our subscription to the uh, Connecticut Education Network to allow more uh, bandwidth to the internet. Yeah, I was just curious, especially if, if we're expecting an increase in devices in the, in the buildings and usage, obviously that's gonna, that's gonna start, you know, start pounding on the network quite heavily. And uh, I mean, and that in itself, not, not even just the bandwidth, I mean, just the usage and the, the types of usage and, and protecting the network from, from, you know, mishaps and other, other things that can happen when people have devices in their hands. Uh, so, yeah, that was my, my question or concern there. And that's one of the areas, Mr. Merriman, if I can jump in real quick, that, yeah. that Ed... Uh, Joe Mancini, Craig Powers, and myself in regards to the ESSER two funding. You know, mm -hmm. right now we're operating in terms of generalities. They've talked about infrastructure upgrades as a COVID-related expense. You know, whether or not we're able to address it through ESSER funding, you know, that remains to be seen. But those are the types of that's the type of research we're gonna we're gonna do. So that's 
yeah, I just think I think with the the increase of of usage and all the devices and stuff, we're gonna that's gonna be coming up. So yeah, okay, thank you. Anyone else? Amanda, Amanda, are you you're on mute? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've been on Zoom calls all day. You would think I, I saw I, I saw know. you talking and yeah. I'm like, you can't read lips. Come on. Um, I just wanted to piggyback off of what you were saying. Um, Tom had mentioned early on that uh, if we look ahead to the fall at the potential of everyone going back and 20 to 25 kids in a classroom, possibly or potentially on a device, um, does Ed or does everybody feel that this is enough to sustain that, anticipating that in the future? I hope what I'm saying, I'm explaining it correctly, but um, no, right it's a now great we question. At, we have some right. kids at home. We have some kids at school. We have, you know, we're, we're not, um, it's not total all internet just being in a school. So. Right. It's a great question. Does our current, will our current network and infrastructure be able to support an increase of a thousand or 1500 more devices in the building every day? I mean, that's an ed question. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like I was explaining to Craig, we're, we're kind of looking at these things. We know where the bottlenecks are. Um, we're even way before COVID, we've been uh, putting um, investments toward the uh, individual schools and their network infrastructures. So we are, years ago, we started with one gigabit connections from fiber connection from the schools to the, uh, up to, to our central office where it connects to the rest of our network. And all five of those have been upgraded to 10 gig, and um, we've you know, we've put money into uh, Clark Lane to get all their stuff at the 10 gig. So everything's 10 gig at the kind of the high level. Um, but we're kind of right now we're just addressing the we're targeting certain areas that we see little issues at. So from you know from a, a high level view, we're in really good shape because um, our core foundation is 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 ready. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Great Thanks, question. Ed. Oh, and um, I missed something way back at the beginning. On page nine, it mentions talented and gifted in the elementary schools. But if you look on page 13, it says 0 0.50 at the elementary schools. So I just wondered if something, so again, page nine at the bottom, it says, Oswagachi, Great Neck, and Quaker Hill tag is zero all the way across, unless I'm missing something. But page 13 says 0.5 at the elementary for tag. So I'm just- Yeah, it is, it is 0.5. Um, okay. I just don't know what line it's being coded to now <laughs> okay. because it uh, last spring uh, after the RTM cut, that was one of the areas that the board uh, voted on to reduce services in. And I don't know if it got recoded when it was reduced from 1.5 to 0.5. Uh, gotcha. We'll research that and get back to the board where it's coded now. No problem. I just couldn't find it and it didn't make sense. So thank you. Uh, Chris. Tom, does the Board of Ed, this goes back to Joy's question and Marsha's question. Does the Board of Ed pay, hey. God bless you. Was that a sneeze? Thank you. You're welcome. Does the Board of Ed pay rent to the town for the building that we're at, we use, that you use? Yeah. We pay, we pay, we give the town money for the usage of town hall, whether you want to call it rent. So years ago, up until I think two years ago, there was a Board of Ed custodian who cleaned town hall and we paid for that. That was kind of our contribution for, for uh, utilizing uh, a good portion of the second floor. That person, uh, that position became vacant. And rather than fill it with a Board of Ed employee um, in a town building, uh, the town said, it probably makes sense to give us a cash contribution. I say cash, through the budgetary process. A, con a monetary contribution and let us 
fulfill the custodial duties however we see fit. Uh, so th that came to the town, I believe, in an MOU maybe a year or two ago. Um, and uh, the board signed that MOU saying, in lieu of providing a custodian, we agree to give the town a monetary contribution equivalent to the cost of a custodian. It's about, Joe can quote me, about 73,000 and change, I believe. That is correct. So let me ask you a question. Can the Board of Ed go back to the town to renegotiate the MOU at a lower amount to offset what Joy and Marsh is talking about for this HR position? I think that's a very creative suggestion and uh, I'm happy to, to begin that conversation with the, the first selectman. If, if that's a, uh, a direction we wanna go, that's pretty creative. Well, if you're, if you're, you're paying to be in that building and we're all in the same umbrella at 73,000, what's the harm in saying, why do we have to pay 73? You want us, you, you're, you have, you used to have, I'm looking at your human resources model that you went yep. over with us for FY21 and 22. It used to be a shared service, right? Where the, the HR director, the board of ed contribution was $16,000 in salary. You budgeted for 25 and now it's increasing to whatever the amount is. Why can't we go back to them and say, come down on the rent so then you can absorb the cost of the HR person and it's less money to Marsha and Joyce point. Tom, isn't there a one year notice provision in that uh, memorandum of understanding? For which one are you talking about? With well, the shared, with, with the town, with the shared services? There. It varies by shared service. Uh, I don't have the, the, the custodial rent MOU uh, in front of me. The uh, HR uh, talks about 180 day notice. I, I was thinking of the custodial one. I thought that- Yeah, the, I can, notice. I'll, I'll look it up. I, again, this I don't have it. There, anyways, there is, there is, it's a year. But if, isn't it worthy of the conversation? Like if all the parties like agree, we, you know, we had COVID, you had to go to make MOUs with the teachers union, I'm sure about COVID related things. So isn't it worth the phone call? Might even be worth a, a, a walk down to the first floor. Well, take the <laughs> elevator. I think it's yeah. a great idea, Chris. <laughs> That's an idea. I will uh, event downstairs. <laughs> Not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and um, looking at that chart you did provide um, that I asked for on the relationship between the shared costs for the town and um, BOE, is the auditorium coordinator the auditorium coordinator through the school? Same, same position, yep. He, uh, a year or two ago, the town asked uh, for some help on AV needs and things of that nature. And so we, uh, we, we worked with them to uh, have that position, help the town out when needed. I, I will tell you, it's not often, but when they, when they need AV support, uh, that position supports the town. Any, any anything else on equipment? Okay. Get to uh, dues and fees, which is starts on page sixty nine. Uh, the amount of twenty nine thousand five thirty eight, which is an increase of six hundred and ninety two dollars. Uh, I know we're in the, the mode of saving as much money as possible, but I think maybe at some point in the future, we should reconsider our uh, membership with CABE. Just a thought. Not, not in this budget, but something to think about going forward. Um, I think it's, it's beneficial. Yeah. 
if if no one has anything is in relation to that section, we have uh, obviously a fairly sizable appendix section here that um, maybe if we just kind of anyone has any general questions or any specific questions related to what's in the appendix, that would be that would be fine. We can kind of address that as a whole. Unless you'd like to go through it section by section, but um, I don't. I don't know that we need to. So. Greg, I have a question. Certainly. Uh, Tom, can you tell us about the declining enrollment? Do you think it's related to the census? And the second part to that question is the reduction in the four FTEs on the academic side or on the instructional side or on the teacher side, am I correct in saying that's related to enrollment being reduced? Is that correct? That's correct. So the answer uh, to the first question about uh, reasoning for a, a decline of enrollment, we've saw during COVID uh, from last March when we went full out for the spring through the fall opening and hybrid and whatnot, we have seen defection to homeschooling. Uh, the hybrid schedule obviously is, is difficult for many families to pull off or uh, full distance, whatever the reason. We have seen an uptick in, uh, in homeschoolers. I wanna differentiate that for the board from full distance learners who are still enrolled students. Uh, homeschoolers uh, means they disenrolled from the district and their parents uh, attest under state statutes that they're gonna educate their child. So. Uh, the enrollment uh, trend is really due to, uh, th in this particular budget around homeschoolers. We, we did, believe it or not, survey homeschoolers to say, you've left during this COVID era, what are your intentions uh, as far as next year to help us plan? Uh, the response uh, wasn't fantastic. And of those uh, who responded, it, it was mixed. I don't have an exact percentage breakdown. Uh, that's been factored in. Uh, and yes, the, the reduction of the classroom FTEs of three at the elementary level and four at Clark Lane, those seven positions are 100% are reflective of enrollment trends. Thank you. There's, there, there's been a, kind of a slow, slow, steady decline in enrollment anyway, right? I mean, over, over the years, it seems... Occasionally, we get a little bubble here and there, but on the whole, it seems to be a kind of a steady, very slow decline, not, not anything huge. Yeah, it's been about 13%, I think, over the last decade or so. Might even be a little bit more of that. Uh, our classroom teacher count has reduced almost percentage on, on the money, 13 or 14%, along with uh, enrollment. Yeah. Um, it is not the catastrophic cliffs some other communities have seen. Um, but again, if you look at our early elementary grades, what used to be steady 200s are, are right around one, 150 to 170. So we're gonna continue to see reductions in, uh, in, in middle and, and beyond in the, you know, in the next decade as those early elementary grades work their way up Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any other comments, any general comments? We've got two more, two more of these sessions and then uh, we'll have our uh, last, <clears throat> um, we'll, we'll have an actual motion to uh, approve the budget, make any uh, last adjustments or anything like that uh, on the, the 28th. So um, Again, I'd like to thank everyone for their efforts in putting this budget together and Ms. Giard for the presentation you gave it was great. Um, and then thank you for the, the staff that's here too as well. I, I failed to recognize you guys earlier. So we definitely appreciate you being here. It's, it's helpful to us uh, when there's questions and, and we appreciate you, you being here. Um, so if anyone, if there's no other further questions, a, a motion to adjourn would be in order and then we'll uh, do this again next week. So moved. Thank you, Marsha. You're welcome. Second. Thank you. <laughs>
I, there's no, no discussion on that one. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? Thank you all, and we'll see you next week. Good night, everyone.